What's up, everyone? This is David with the Friendly Bear Podcast. Today, I have a special guest, Maya Lee, joining the podcast. Um, I was introduced to Maya Lee from other podcasts he's done. And also, here in the office and trade space, Eduardo Briseño, Edu Trades, is actually here for the week. And he was mentioning Maya. And I was like, oh, I got a podcast coming up with him. This is kind of cool. It's a small world of traders, apparently. You know, uh, so yeah, it's pretty cool to have Maya on, and uh, yeah, we're just gonna get to know Maya here on the podcast and and see what he's all about. So, how are you doing, Maya? Doing good, man. How are you? I'm doing great, man. Doing great here in Puerto Rico, just uh, enjoying enjoying trading, enjoying the beach. Everything's cool. Uh, how about you? So, wh- where where are you? Where are you located? Uh, I just got here to Florida. I just moved. Florida. Wow. Everyone seems to be yeah. Going I was over actually there. on my way. I was on my way to Puerto Rico and um, <laughs> plans changed, but yeah, I ended up here. So I'm in Florida now. I just moved from Austin. From Austin. Okay, cool. And yeah. you were, okay. So you want to give maybe a background on yourself and uh, how you got started and yeah, just the basics. Sure. I mean, I'll, I'll give you like a brief story of how I got started. Um, I started in trading in 2012. Um, I was, selling cars at the time. I was 22 years old. I uh, was just selling cars. And um, I ran into a guy that I worked with that used to uh, own a hedge fund. And um, he would trade all the time while we were working. And um, he was just this older guy. And uh, he was a pretty cool cat. But he got a liking to me. And he just, uh, we would eat lunch every day together. And he just said, hey, this is something that you should learn. You know, this is a, this is a great skill to have. This is something that you could you know, uh, take many years to, uh, progress at, and it's something that you could use for the rest of your life. And, um, so I just kind of listened to him and, and I took his advice and I opened up a trading account and just, just started buying stuff, you know, mainly like big caps and swinging big caps, uh, and not really knowing what I was doing, just learning, uh, losing money, learning really. And so that's how I originally got started was I was, uh, selling cars and I, uh, worked with the guy who, used to own a hedge fund and, and, uh, he basically just advised me, Hey, this is something that you could learn and, and use for the rest of your life. It's just going to take you know, a lot of time to do. So if you invest the time now, it'll be worth it for the rest of your life. And so I just took his advice, but I remember whenever I first got into it, first started buying stocks. I mean, I was hooked right away. I, I, I loved it. I, I found that I had a passion for it. So that, that was the original, you know, uh, starting for me. Um, yeah, but I traded for about two years. I lost all my money and, um, it wasn't just big caps. I started getting into small caps. And during that time, there was a lot of OTC pump and dumps, you know, they're not Mm -hmm. so much around anymore. OTCs are kind of hit or miss, you know, that's just not the same type of market. But back then, um, there was a lot of pump and dumps. And so whenever I was swinging big caps, I saw these small caps running pretty big. And um, I thought, man, I could like double or triple my money. And so I started going like all in and these, you know, OTC pump and dumps. And then I would, you know, get dumped overnight for 80%. So over about a two year period, um, I pretty much lost all my savings. And so I didn't have any money, even though I had a job, I was still making money. I didn't have any savings. So I took about a year and a half off because I didn't have any left, you know, money left in my account. And um, so I still paid attention to the market, but I just wasn't trading. And then I came back around 2015, 2016. And that's whenever I, uh, um, you know, came back and just started trading every day whenever I saved up enough money again and, and um, started getting back into it. I'd say it would take me or it took me another year just to kind of learn how to not lose money. And then um, I want to say my fourth year is whenever I started becoming profitable, you know, or at least consistently profitable. And then it just kind of grew from there, really. And and then I quit my job and I've just been trading full time since then. So, yeah. Gotcha. Um, wh- when were you working at the car dealership? When? Yeah. What year was that? 2012. 2012. I, I worked, yeah, I started 2012. Well, actually, I started 2011, but I didn't start trading until 2012. So I started August 2011 was uh, whenever I started uh, at the car dealership. I was selling cars. I uh, sold cars for a year and a half. I did really well at it. I was just kind of a natural at it. And I got moved to finance manager. I was finance manager for about five of those years after that. And um, 
what I would do is I would trade in the morning, um, basically from a little bit prior to market open and then about the first half hour or 45 minutes after market open. And then I would go to work. So I'd basically just, you know, buy or, um, you know, some stocks that I wanted to uh, swing. And then I would, um, you know, get in and then I'd go to work and be there all day until 10, 11 o'clock at night. Then I'd wake up the morning and do the same thing, be trading in the morning and then, yeah, and then go to work. That's I got how it all started. And uh, you mentioned OTCs. So were you doing OTCs mostly? No, not mostly. I was mainly swinging big caps. Like big caps. I, I, I said, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, for instance, AMD. Uh, I was own, I owned AMD whenever it was like around 2 and $3 um, back in the, uh, that time. And, you know, I was swinging it and selling it at like $4 a, a share. So it was, um, it was back whenever it was still pretty cheap. And so it was, I was mainly doing big caps more than anything. I didn't have a lot of money. I was buying just very little shares. That's kind of why I made the transition from big cap, big caps to small caps. Cause I thought, well, I'm never going to get rich doing this. You know, I'm, I'm making like $200 in a month swinging these big caps. You know, a lot of these are kind of higher priced and they just aren't that, that volatile. So, um, and I didn't have a lot of money to take any size. So that's whenever I made the transition into small caps and I was buying like these dollar or, you know, 50 cent stocks that can move, you know, hundred, 200 percent in a day or over a week, something like that before they would dump out. Um, but a lot of the times that I was buying them, it was, you know, right around the tops so I was getting dumped on. So, yeah, yeah. I didn't so know, I, I didn't know anything about shorting at that time. I got I was you. Just long, I was long in everything. Got you. So, and when you first got started, did you see this, the hedge fund uh, guy that you were working with in the, in the dealership or the former hedge fund guy? Um, yeah. Did you see it as like a career path or like a long-term thing that you can, that you want to do like for the majority of your income? No, I didn't. I didn't see that until I came back to the market. So when I lost all my money, it was pretty, you know, detrimental to me, you know, being that age, I, I had about $60,000 saved up. So I had lost, you know, about roughly 60 grand over that two year period, you know, and, and having that type of money, I didn't grow up with money. So having that type of money in your early twenties was, you know, uh, it's, it's a good amount of money to me, or it was. And, um, I mean, it still is, it's, you know, $60,000, but, uh, what I was saying is it didn't, become a thing that I saw myself doing long-term until whenever I came back to the market. And it was, it was just because when I took that like year and a half to two years off and I told myself, Hey, I'm going to save up enough money again and get back into it. But I never really thought, Hey, I'm going to do this for a career. Um, I was still working at the dealership and I, I made good money at the dealership. You know, I was making, you know, multiple six figures. So um, it's not like I needed the cash or, or needed to find a different, you know, avenue of uh, income. Um, I enjoyed what I did at the dealership. It was just very time consuming. You know, I was working 10, 12 hour days every day, including Saturdays. The only day I had off was, you know, Sundays mainly. And we would only get one to two weeks off per year. So um, I was pretty committed to my job at that time. But um, after so many years of doing that and then taking the two years off, you know, I had some some real insight and, and thought, you know, I, I don't want to be in the car business forever. And, and I started looking at different things. You know, I even opened up a couple of different businesses or tried them and uh, they failed. Um, but I remember, you know, I had remembered whenever I was trading, I thought, you know, I sucked at trading, but I actually really loved doing that. And I want to see, you know, if I... If, where, where it can go. Like if I really put the time and dedication into learning, like obviously I didn't know what I was doing. and I lost all my money, but if I really put in the homework and worked hard at it, like I do at my job now, you know, there's, there's definitely a possibility I could get good enough to where, you know, I could do this for a career. I mean, I, I had a passion for it. I just needed to put in the work. So that's what I did. I ended up quitting my job early and um, I uh, didn't work for a full year. And so what I did was I promised myself, I said, okay, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to work for a full year and I'm just going to focus specifically on trading. And if I'm not profitable in a year, well, then I need to go back and get another job at the dealership. And so that's what I did. I traded for the full year. I didn't actually lose money. I broke even when I came back and it was, I I just, I put in so much time. I was, you know, pretty much at the computer 15, 16 hours a day. 
and uh, even on weekends, Sunday and Saturday, uh, tracking data, you know, uh, testing things, journaling, going over trades. I was just completely dedicated to it. And um, so at the end of the year, um, I noticed, you know, I didn't lose money this time. I actually broke even. But the thing is, I'm not making any money to, you know, survive on this. So I stuck to my promise and I said, okay, I'm going to go back to the dealership, but I'm going to continue to trade. I'm going to continue to do this because I think I can get good enough to do it. I really enjoy it. So I went back and I spoke to my old boss and I said, hey, uh, I'll come back and work for you guys. But on my terms, I'm going to do it part time. And as a you know manager, you know, in the car dealerships, a finance manager, sales manager, that's just unheard of. You don't do part time. So it took me about a month to kind of close him on the, the idea, but he finally said yes. And I think it was just because I did really well whenever I was there. You know, I was always a good employee and we had a good relationship. So he finally agreed to it. So what I, I had changed my schedule. So when I went back to uh, uh, having a job, I was still trading full time. You know, I was at the market from, you know, an hour before the open and I was there for the full day until close. And then I would go into work right after that. And then I would be there until, you know, 10, 11 o'clock at night uh, that night. So I was working from, you know, basically like 7.30. The market opened and I was living in Austin. So the market opened at 8.30. I was at my computer at 7.30 and I'd be there all day. And then I would go to work and then I would get home around, you know, 11 or midnight and then um, then wake up and do the exact same thing. And it took me about a year um, to where I decided, hey, I'm, I'm making a lot more money now. Uh, than I am in the car business. I'm just going to quit. So um, I just kind of use the income as a cushion or a stress reliever to not like force to uh, myself to take, you know, make money in the market. I basically just gave myself the chance to uh, focus to where I could uh, become profitable. You know, yeah. I just didn't know how long it was going to take. You know, I didn't know if it was going to take six months, a year, two years, however long. So, so yeah. you were, you were grinding. You were grinding, you're, man. You're grinding. Yeah, I still do. <laughs> yeah, you have to. Of course, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you it's, be part hustler, of, man. it's part of it. You know, it's just a, a lot of people don't understand how much grinding it takes to. So okay, so did you see the light at the end of the tunnel after a certain point? Like you were, I did. You were break even. Break even is actually pretty good for like one year of trading in the beginning. So, uh, so you were yeah. break even. How did you feel during that period? And like, how much did you were, were you like on, on the on the verge or something? Did you feel like you were on the on the verge? Like you're about to crack the code a little bit or? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, it wasn't one year, you know, I, I had already traded that first couple years and then I took the time off. So I had the first couple years and then I came back. So yeah. it was, you know, kind of a total of about three years. So it took like, you know, almost three years to basically get to break even. And then that fourth year is when I became profitable. And, and um, I wouldn't say light of the tunnel or anything. I knew there was a time in my uh, trading career that I just knew it. I, I thought, um, I'm going to be good at this. You know, I, I love it enough. I'm putting enough time into it. I'm, I'm getting, I can see progress. I'm getting better. And so I, I wouldn't say like light at the end of the tunnel. I just knew I'm going to be uh, good at this. It, it was more of like a, a when, not if, Yeah. you know, like, you know, like, am I going to be good at this? It was more like, when am I going to be good at this? You know, I just didn't know how long it was going to take, but this is a promise I made to myself. I told myself, I'm not going to quit my job until I can make at least double a year's salary uh, trading than I can in the car business. So, um, and whenever I started becoming like pretty, pretty consistent and pretty profitable, I actually did it in three months. Um, I doubled my yearly salary uh, at the car business just uh, from trading in, in a three month period. So uh, that was kind of like the sign to me. I was like, okay, I, I think I'm good enough to where I can, you know, I can quit. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. So that's what I did. Yeah. I just took the leap of faith really. Yeah. So the, the I, first, I, was, I was pretty yeah. confident. Yeah. I was pretty For confident. sure. Absolutely. So, okay. So you, you mentioned you didn't even know what, what short selling was the first go around. So the second yeah. go around, uh, was that, so you mentioned 2012 and all that. And the first thing that crossed my mind or like kind of was that Tim Grittani was buying like uh the OTC pump and dumps around that time with the awesome penny stocks. And, and then yeah. the awesome penny stocks guy got arrested and the OTC pumps, they kind of went away for a while and they emerged mm -hmm. later on or something like that. But um, mm -hmm. so when you came, when you came back to the market, you understood what short selling was, did you decide maybe I should try shorting? Maybe I should try longing. Like what, 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 um, what did you gravitate to as a trader? Like, how did you, 
like uh you know what did you what was your preferred setups or that's, like that's a, that's a good trade? question that's a good question so what i i mainly focused on was uh building out you know like strategies and i i did learn about shorting because of the guy that i worked with at the dealership you know he i showed him all my trades and stuff and i told him you know hey this is what happened to me i got dumped on on these you know these stocks and he said you know that was the first time i had heard the term pump and dump and he said you know, he was like, Hey, you, you got to short those. And I was like, you know, what the hell is shorting? And so he explained it to me and I, and I thought, okay, wow. Okay. I didn't know you could make money as the stock goes down, you know? Um, so that's whenever I started kind of like building out some strategies. Okay. What, what is a, you know, a good opportunity to short? What, what would make sense to short and what makes it work? You know, what, um, what provides the highest odds? Um, that's when I started learning about dilution as well. Um, so when I actually became profitable and consistently profitable, I was mainly sticking to small caps and I was, uh, you know, mainly sticking to stuff that, um, you know, companies that didn't make any money were highly dilutive, um, you know, uh, had a history of like dumping offerings, so that type of stuff, uh, all day fades. So, um, I started tracking data and, and that's kind of how I, you know, uh, built out everything. It was me and a close buddy of mine, uh, his name's Lucas. Uh, people know him as a short bear online. Um, we started building out strategies where, uh, you know, we were gathering all this data, we would categorize it and we would find out uh, the odds, uh, you know, the odds of uh, a trade working and, you know, and how it worked, you know, what made it work and what odds uh, or what things needed to be involved and what things would create, um, you know, situations where those odds would be skewed, you know. Uh, to where we would um, be more patient or, or just not even trade those uh, type of plays, you know, uh, what, what, you know, kind of separate everything to where we can see the differences of what made uh, an, a stock fade all day. And then which ones would not, you know, even though they almost looked the same, uh, you know, on the daily and like pre-market uh, gaps, um, you know, maybe even they were the same market cap and float size, institutional ownership, what separated the ones that ran and the ones that actually faded. And we kind of broke it down that way. And so uh, we built out these strategies to where, you know, we we're, you know, uh, sticking to, you know, specific things to where we could, you know, take the most high probability trades, short them in the morning or at least around the open and then just hold them all day. And that's kind of how we, you know, kind of start building our accounts uh, to where we were, you know, consistently profitable. And um, that's, you know, how it worked really for me. Yeah. So, I mean, I don't even trade that stuff anymore. <laughs> I don't the all day trade faders. Like so, I, I, you know, I'm more of a product of, of like COVID and after COVID. Um, I, I didn't really trade much before that, but, um, so the, the, these were all day faders. They would behave a lot better back then. Is that, is that. Yeah. Like, every once in a while you'll see some, it's just that they aren't nearly as, per, you know, uh, relevant in my opinion and, and small caps, uh -huh. um, you know, you, you have so many of these, uh, algorithms that run nowadays. There's so much retail that are, in now that weren't in the, there in the past um we have so much more volume um uh there's just other things involved even even stocks today that drop offerings it's like offerings don't dump out like they used to you know um and i i would say that transition happened somewhere around 2019 you know 2016 and prior or even 17 you know you get a stock that would you know dump an offering midday and you know it would just go straight down 50 percent, something like that and um, so if you were short, it's like you would just hold for the, uh, you know, the, uh, the offering price, you know, depending on how yeah. many shares they had to dump. And we don't see that really at all anymore. And uh, I think when I really started seeing a change in that was 2019, whenever MBOT uh, ran and it dropped like three offerings over like a, a week period. And every single time it dropped an offering, it, uh, it just kept squeezing. Wait, three and, offerings uh, in a week? Yeah, it was like three different offerings in a week. Wow. Um, I mean, I didn't end up trading it. Um, I was actually out of town during that time. I just remember watching it. And every time it dropped an offering, it would, it would squeeze the next day. And then it would look like it was going to die out, you know, it would sell off. And then next thing you know, the news would come out again, and then it would squeeze even higher. And it just did it for like a, a week straight. It just was a multi-day run. So the, the all day fades that we see, used to see in the past are just not the same anymore, yeah. you know, but, but that's the market, you know, the market shifts and you yeah. have to adjust. So what I used to trade back in the day is not the same. And even just a couple of years ago, what I used to trade is not the same now. Yeah. So, you know, you're, you're constantly having to uh, adjust and shift things around to, 
you know, um, adapt to the market really. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. So you mentioned collecting data and all that, like how heavy are, were you in, into data and like, has that still remained the same? Are you still like a data, you know, always back testing, always checking the, the odds and like, is that a big part of your game plan? all the time i don't uh i don't track as much as i used to i tracked a lot back in the day uh, me and my buddy lucas we tracked a lot um i want to say we had um thousands of uh spreadsheets uh with um you know multiple uh strategies and um we don't even we didn't even some of the strategies we didn't even use because we would gather all the data and then we would just realize this isn't a high probability setup. You know, there's just too many scenarios that can happen that ruin the the odds. You know, it's just not good enough to trade. So um, it's it's hard to say really. We we tracked a lot of things and um, tested a lot of things uh, on, and we we used Thinkorswim. That's mainly what we used. So we would gather the data manually. We didn't have any script or any code to like pull the data out or anything. Neither of us knew how to code. We would just go into, you know, Thinkorswim. We'd pull up stocks from, you know, multiple years uh, that had, you know, um, uh, similarities in like market cap, float size, um, you know, institutional ownership, uh, whether it was up on news or not, whether it was up on earnings, um, all kinds of different things. And so we would categorize it and we would manually pull out the data and then type it into Excel. And we would just do that for hours. So he lived in Germany at the time. I lived in Austin. And so our time, uh, you know, our schedules were different. It was like it was daytime for me when it was nighttime for him. So I'd be pulling the data during the day. And then I'd go to sleep at like midnight, one o'clock, two o'clock in the morning, send it to him. And then he'd wake up that next morning and then start working on it as well. And then he'd be pulling the data for hours. And that's basically how we did it. And then we would combine spreadsheets and then we would, you know, kind of break it down from there. And, you know, check out what what kind of data we were pulling and see if we we needed to pull more or if this was a viable strategy or not to uh dig into so yeah yeah but it's to answer your question about the do i still do it i don't really do it so much anymore and it's mainly just because everything that i trade is still based off of a lot of that data that data does uh slightly change but um it's easy to see when it changes so I, I, I kind of just uh, adjust um, myself, you know, in, in my trading. I, I don't necessarily, um, you know, gather new data to, you know, um, adjust, uh, adjust it. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is I just do it kind of in my head at this point. It's like I'm trading the same setups, but maybe I just need to be more patient. You know, instead of like a day three move, maybe it's, you know, a day five move instead, you know, just to kind of give a general idea of what I'm doing. Gotcha. That makes and, sense. Yeah, it does. It does. Um, Cause like, I know with trading everything, a lot of things are like front loaded, you know, after getting experience and screen time and having the same, the, the setups like gradually evolve, but still remain the same. Like, you know, yeah. you can just adjust accordingly. Like as, as you know, as you get more experience, like, um, like for example, for me, like uh, there's a, there was a newer trader over here and I always preach about journaling. And I still journal, but I don't journal the way I used, yeah, like the way I used to, like really extremely looking deep dive in inside why I be traded a certain way or why, it, you know, like, a, like a real journal, like a psychological journal with like the technical analysis and the fundamentals and why I entered the trade with the thesis. I don't go like that hardcore because I, 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 I have it internal now, you know? Exactly. So, yeah, you know, um, but yeah, it's still all, you still do it. You just, it's a little bit, you know, just. Well, some of the stuff, whenever you're journaling, it's like, you know, already, but it's like, you're more, you're more focused on, you know, what you're uh, doing wrong versus, um, you know, like writing down all the notes of stuff that you already know. Right. Yeah. It's more like, Hey, I'm making these mistakes. I should really focus on how to improve here versus, uh, when you're first starting, it's like you, you're talking about, you know, let's use it as basic as simple, you know, as possible. Like you're, you're writing down like support and resistance and stuff like that. It's like you don't really need to write that down anymore. It's like you already know it yeah. just by looking at the chart or what happened, to, you know, during the day or whatever it may be. It's you're more focused on the more intricate things that you can work on to, you know, improve your trading versus the basic stuff that is already ingrained. 
Yeah, and that's that like yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's like a year year four, year five trader versus a year two, year one, year three. Yeah, you know, just constantly evolving as a trader while internalizing all the stuff that's compounded yeah. over time. You know, yeah, it's 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 uh yeah, it's good stuff. So um, how long does it take you to process uh to go into a trade? You mentioned the Excel sheet, the data that you have, and and uh, you, that's a long process. You guys do you, yeah. uh, you know. So how long does it take you to decide like uh, to enter it? So um, let's say if um, in the morning, say pre market, something's popping up, right, and it, it grabs my attention. Um, I can look at the stock, look at the charts, um, look a little bit into the company, see what it's all about, uh, assess everything, uh, look at the volume, um, see what type of volatility, what range it has. Um, and then if I'm looking to short it, you know, even look at like locate prices, just kind of go down the list of everything that I'm kind of going through in my head. I can do all of that within maybe a two to uh, four minute time frame, you know, uh, to see if it's even a, a play for me. Uh, but there's, ha there has to be things that check off the box for me to even dig farther. You know what I mean? So yeah. if I'm pulling up the chart and it's, you know, I can see that it's a liquid, it's not up very much, uh, you know, it's, it doesn't have that much range, uh, then I'm just, I'm going to the next stock. You know, I'm not even digging even farther. That takes, you know, maybe 30 seconds, right? Uh, but if it's something that's grabbing my attention, then I'm starting to check off the other boxes. Okay, what does this look like? What is this? What is this information? Why is it up? Is it up on, you know, news or is it up on earnings? Is this, uh, you know, a part of the hot sector that's been running? Um, you know, what's, what's going on with, you know, X, Y, Z, I'm just kind of checking off all the boxes and I can do that in about two, maybe four minute period. Yeah. Gotcha. Wow. Okay. And, uh, how does like dilution and fundamentals factor into that? Um, I'm not so much of a fundamental trader as I used to be, uh, just cause everything's kind of changed. I mean, it's gotta have a big enough run and enough shares to dump in order for me to, you know, have like conviction and a fundamental, uh, you know, based type of trade um, just because sometimes a lot of these algorithms nowadays, it's like maybe a stock has, you know, hundreds of millions of shares to dump, but um, they aren't going to dump them, you know, that day, they're just going to kind of trade it in a channel and, and dump it, you know, within the price range that they want to. Um, and they might even run it a little bit higher before, you know, they uh, decide to really let it go. So um, I'm, I'm really not so much of a fundamental, a fundamental based trader as much as I used to be, uh, where I would be, you know, digging pretty deep into uh, the filings and figuring out how much, you know, this company has to, you know, dump and if they're, you know, under the baby shelf or not. And, and then, um, you know, having conviction to, you know, short the trade pretty heavily. Um, I don't you know, do it so much anymore. It's got to have a big enough run and it's got to have enough shares to dump and it's got to have enough liquidity in order for me to have conviction to, you know, say, okay, like based on these fundamentals, I'm going to, you know, uh, use that as conviction. Yeah, for, for sure. So you mentioned the algo. So how, how do you sense if an algo is in there? Uh, like, is there certain things like, for example, I, I noticed some, like, I'm not, I'm not no, no expert at all by any means, but I can kind of sense them sometimes when there's like a lot of volume and the catalyst is weak and they have, like an ATM or something, and it's a certain investment bank or whatever, and uh, it's like, it's like wants to crack the VWAP, but it doesn't, and then it's like you know, <laughs> or like it's it's like the, it breaks the high of day by a little bit, and then like it does, yeah. you know. So like, how, how I do think you the biggest it? thing is liquidity. The biggest thing I think is liquidity. You know, you have to consider the fact they're trying to dump shares. How are they going to do it? You know, uh, they need somebody on the other end to fill those that that side. So if they're dumping shares, they need buyers, right? If they're not getting buyers, they're going to use shorts, you know, and if they're getting both, then they're going to, you know, definitely dump because they're getting all the liquidity that they need. So the biggest thing is look, look, the liquidity, really. And uh, if they are not getting any liquidity or enough of it, then the algorithm will, you know, basically trade it within a channel, you know, it'll uh, be supporting the stock, you know, it's going to be loading into it to where it can support the stock. Uh, create certain moves to draw in, you know, buyers or draw in uh, shorts, uh, push the stock to certain levels to where they can get people to either cover or to, to buy and then sell into them. And then if they aren't getting the liquidity, then they're going to keep that buy all go on. You know, they're going to keep it within that channel and they're just going to kind of bounce it around until they get enough shares uh, sold. 
So it's it's all about uh, liquidity uh, to them. You know, if they if they just decided, hey, <clears throat> sorry, if they just decided, hey, we're going to dump all these shares, but they don't have the buyers uh, for it. You know, the stock's just going to go straight down, and then they're going to be selling at prices that they don't want to. You know, they're going to be selling at prices much lower, and they're not going to make as much money. So how they make the money or sell at the prices that they do, then they're going to have to somehow create that liquidity. You know, whether that's supporting the stock. Um, whether that's uh, creating moves to, you know, get bite people to buy it, um, squeezing shorts, all those things, really. Yeah. It's so interesting, the whole algo thing, because like I, there's a, a really good fundamental trader over here and that is like a CFA and stuff. And uh, I talk about it sometimes like, oh, there's an algo in here, but like I can't really uh, make like explain it <laughs> as well as I like I would like. Or like like the way you just did, you actually explained it pretty good. And he calls me a conspiracy theorist, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know, man. I have I have yet to trade a stock, or at least nowadays, I have yet to see a stock nowadays trade without some type of algorithm on it. You know, it's like very rare that you'll find something that's that's solely uh retail. I mean, and if it yeah. is solely retail, then it's gonna be highly illiquid and it's gonna be very um, you know, the spread's gonna be wide, it's it's gonna be very jumpy and it's going to, the volume is going to die out, you know, um, as well. So, so yeah. w- when did it become clear to you with that? Because you traded like before like 2019, 2018, when did, when things used to behave differently? Um, yeah. Like when did you notice that? Was that like a big, like a aha moment for you? And did you see the op- more opportunity with that? Cause like, you know, um, just behave differently in what way? Like with algorithms? Like, or- yeah. 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 <laughs> um, Whenever I would get stopped out, that was probably the biggest thing, you know, like I would find myself in these high probability trades. I would, had high conviction. I would be taking size. I would build into the, the, the trade very well. And the, the trade would be working like uh, as I expected it to. And then next thing you know, I'm, I'm getting stopped out on the trade. So uh, I would turn like a, um, a trade that I'm up thousands of dollars in into now a losing trade. And then now the stock's back on trend. And, I, and if I had never stopped out, I would have, you know, made money. And so that became clear, okay, why did it make that move? Um, what made that happen? And then why did it just get right back on trend right after, even after all of that volume came in? You know, what was the point of doing that? What was the point of that stock making that move, having all that volume come in just to get back on trend? So it, it seemed to me, it's like, okay, somebody was trying to get filled somewhere how, and, what, and why were they doing it? And, and how did they do it? You know, and that, you know, got me kind of thinking in, in the sense of, um, you know, if I if I was on the other end, you know, if, say if I was uh, somebody that was trying to dump, you know, millions of shares and I wanted to get filled at an average price of, you know, X, um, you know, I would if I'm not getting liquidity, then I'm going to I'm going to need to make some type of move in order to, you know, get those shares filled um, or at least, um, you know, push the stock um, a certain way to, you know, get people to cover their position or, or buy, you know? Um, so I, I was trying to think of it in, in the terms of if I was the person that was trying to get rid of those shares, how would I do it? You know? And uh, then it started becoming a little bit more clear. Yeah. yeah. And that's what I look for. A lot of the times mm-hmm. it's like, if I have high conviction on a trade and the trade's working and um, then I, I'm looking for it to continue to work. I, I don't want to see the signs of, you know, it's holding at key levels or, or it breaks down and then reclaims right away. It's like, why did that happen? That shouldn't have happened. Um, what's going on? Like, is are they just not getting enough liquidity here? And if they aren't, well, then maybe I should be looking to get out of this trade because um, maybe they're going to push back up to this level and then I'll just get another entry on it. So I'll take the money now and I'll wait for that move to come, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. so how, how do you go about sizing into a trade? Are you recycling shares? Are you doing like, you know, three bullets or like how, how are you what's your process it really depends on the, the type of play you know it depends on whether it's small cap mid cap big cap um how volatile the stock is you know if it's grinding if it's very volatile that has tons of range just depends on you know what the type of play is you know uh, it also depends on how liquid it is or not so if it's a slow mover if it's a grinder and i know that you know, it's, let's say if I'm looking to short the stock and um, um, I know that it's probably going to top out somewhere in, you know, XYZ price range, but I'm not really sure where it's going to top out at. 
then I'll start slowly scaling in, you know, at, at spots that I think are, are good levels to, uh, you know, get into position. Even if I know I'm a little bit early, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, you know, slowly scale into a position for a big move, you know, uh, for a big move down. And that can, that can uh, reverse in a long as well. I do the same thing with a long. If I know the stock is going to be reversing trend and it's just kind of like taking its sweet time, then I'm going to slowly kind of build into it. I don't ever want to get too big too early and uh, end up cutting and then taking a loss just to get right back in. That doesn't make sense to me. I would rather, you know, uh, build in small. And the thing is, I, I don't ever really like to get in early at all. I, I like to wait for the moment uh, to, you know, uh, be, you know, I guess what I'm saying is I like to wait for the right moment to get in, but sometimes that's hard to judge. So um, if it's a slow mover, that's how I'll do it. I'll slowly scale in. If it's a really volatile stock, then I'm going to be very patient. I'm going to wait for the right time. And then I'm going to probably be hitting big size right away. And that's how I do it on the, on the volatile moves, the real quick, fast movers that can move, you know, multiple dollars in one candle type of thing. Yeah. Awesome. So you mentioned some longs in there. So how, what's your like percentage of long versus short or short versus long? Um, recently it's been roughly like 50, 50. Yeah. Recently yeah. I would say, you know, in, in 2022, it's been about 50, 50. I'm, I'm longing just as much as I'm shorting, but um, in previous years, it's always been like 80, 20, you know, like short 80% of the time and, you know, long 20% of the time. Um, not that I don't like longing. It's just that I'm just much better at shorting. I'm more comfortable with it. Um, yeah. That's how a lot of my strategies were built. And uh, that's how uh, I have an easier time reading it, you know, as well. I can see a, a change in trend, um, you know, uh, when a stock is done running versus when it's done dumping. So um, that's just how, what I'm more, you know, comfortable with and what I have more experience with. But recently, I would say it's more like 50-50 this year. You know, I'm longing just as much as I'm shorting. Yeah, I made more money today longing than I did shorting. Gotcha. And do you use the longs to help like the shorts? Because like... Do you long and short the same stock, I guess? Like you run it, you go for the run up and then you short the, the backside or do you just like long it and you're done with it and you see another stock that's like more of a short opportunity and so you hit that one short or do you, you know what I mean? Like, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, let's, um, so like for one of my more uh, preferred, you know, plays, I like stocks that just make those big like supernova moves. Like we had the energy, like oil runs recently yeah, with like yeah. INDO, IMPP. You know, a lot of those like went parabolic. Um, you know, I I, uh, I was longing those, but I wasn't longing them until I knew that shorts were trapped. You know, um, so I wasn't longing them early on. I wasn't making like the the big run up. Um, I wasn't longing any of those plays until I knew that hey, there's probably people shorting this now, and they're probably shorting it pretty heavy, and they're going to get trapped, and I'm going to be there to catch the squeeze. Right? Those are the times that I was longing them, and then once they got blown out, then I switched short. So. Um, that's the type of play that I would long and then short. Um, if it's, if it's like a multi-day run and it never really makes like that parabolic move or like that big, like supernova, you know, straight up type of move. Yeah. Um, then it's not something that I'll probably be playing long. You know, the times that I like to be playing long is whenever they're, uh, you know, very volatile, something that it's, uh, I can see is easily going to trap and squeeze, um, the stuff that I used to get trapped on, you know? So the stuff that I used to get squeezed on, I'm, you know, those are the ones that I like to long, you know? So, yeah, I got to start uh, implementing that. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I just don't yeah. short low floats anymore, but I'm like a lot of them, like, like INDO or like last year, LGVN, uh, I don't know, a couple of others, they do these multi-day runs and like, I, I just don't short them anymore, but uh, like, why not long them, you know? Yeah. So, oh, the INDO, yeah, that one was a little scary, but, um, you know, it was like at $5 from the initial run. You know, I think it started like February 22nd was the day one run. It had pretty high volume and then, but it didn't actually make the big move until like a week later. So, yeah. um, so from $5 up to like $87, just a matter of time, yeah, when it's that crazy. decides to top out and pull back. So you just kind of wait for everybody to get blown out first before you show short something with, a low float like that. Um, but I'm the same way. I don't like to short low floats, um, but I, I will at the right moments uh, just because when, when they're ready, uh, then yeah. they're, they're great plays. Yeah. Like the day INDO dumped, you know? Yeah. When, the, yeah, absolutely. 
I caught that one really nicely. It, it, I mean, it even squeezed uh, that same day pre-market up to 80 bucks or like $81. And I was short at 80 bucks and it dumped all the way down to like the 30s that day. And um, so that's, you know, huge dump um, over 50%. So nice move. So, so that's one of those like first red day strategies. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty, yeah, first red day. So like uh, what, what's what type of setups do you gravitate towards? Um. Well, I have multiple plays, you know, or multiple strategies that I like to trade. Um, but the ones that I gravitate more towards uh, is the ones that have multi-day runs, stuff that's, um, you know, overly extended, uh, stuff that it's like if I'm going to be, you know, I'm trying to imagine if I was long and I, if I was a swing long, like when would I want to be taking profits? You know, when would I feel like, okay, like this thing's had a big enough run, like I'll go ahead and start selling now. Or, um, you know, uh, everyone's afraid to short it at that time because they've been getting squeezed for multiple days. Uh, those are the type of plays that I look for uh, or gravitate towards more, you know? Yeah. Um, and how about like level two and tape? Level two and tape? Yeah. I mean, I implemented a lot into my trading, but it's, it's mainly just because of uh, entries. You know, I'm looking more at charts. Uh, like the daily chart, you know, intraday charts, um, maybe higher time frame charts, you know, for multiple days. I'm looking at the charts for it to set up first and then say the day that comes that I'm going to be trading that thing. Uh, we'll use INDO, for instance. I'm looking at the tape to confirm my thesis. What I'm seeing on the daily is this thing's ready. I want to see the tape and level two confirm that. You know, I want to see the signs of this thing actually saying, hey, it's exhausted and it's going to go down. You know, so level two and taper are, are important, but it's not everything. You know, it's just a small piece of the puzzle. Um, and it's mainly just for entries, you know, exits as well. You know, it's definitely for exits as well, but I'm, I'm mainly using charts as well for like profit targets. Um, but if the level two and taper are giving me signs that, you know, my profit target's not going to get hit, then, um, you know, then I'll, I'll, uh, I'll cover out or I'll sell my position, whether that's long or short. Yeah. For sure. And what about like your most memorable uh, trade or ticker? Most memorable trade or ticker. So I don't really, um, I don't really have one in mind. Um, um, there's a, there's a lot, right? There's a lot of stocks that I've gotten squeezed on or made a lot of money on or, um, you know, whatever it may be, but I would, I would have to say there is one that kind of sticks out and it's not just because of, um, what I did is because of uh, what happened that day. It was Kodak, K O D K. Oh, yeah, that's in, right. Was that with, with so, Donald Trump? Um, yeah, 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 it was hilarious, right? Um, but it was most memorable just because um, that specific day, that was the, the I, so I mentored two guys, my, my brother and my best friend. And um, it was the very first day that those guys sat next to me and, uh, and started uh, learning how to trade. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I'm getting short at 60 bucks, you know, pretty heavy. And my buddy has no idea what's going on. He doesn't even know what type of play it is. He Wait, just, so hold, hold one second. Know, so, so you're watching sure. the TV and when like Donald Trump is on is, or that already happened. That already happened. This Kodak okay. had already made like a, a couple day, you know, move. And it's, it already squeezed oh, okay, up to okay. 60 bucks, you know, like it already made like it's huge move that day straight up uh, yeah. from like, what was it? Like a $20 or something. Uh, and then it would just went straight yeah. up to like 60. Yeah. 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 And it, it did it in like five candles or something like that. Um, so um, the only reason it's most memorable for me is because these guys have no idea to what type of play this <laughs> is. You know, they've, they've never seen this before. You know, I'm super excited. I'm thinking like, I'm going to bank here. Like, this is so much fun. Like I, I love that we're getting this type of play because they're so rare. Yeah. And um, so I'm loading in this thing at like 60 bucks, like, and it's, it's a uh, down halting. Right. And um, I'm thinking like, this is awesome. I'm gonna make like six figures on this trade. And um, my buddy who has no idea what he's doing was sitting right next to me and just decided to short it too. And he doesn't just get in with like a little bit. He gets in with a lot for his size. Right. Um, and he made 17 grand, you know, the very first Damn. day that he, uh, on that, that specific <laughs> trade, he made, se he oh made my 17 God. grand. Is, yeah. He just, he just followed me into the trade, you know, yeah. I, I guess he saw, like, I was excited. I'm loading into it. And, um, 
he, yeah, he just followed me into the trade. And, uh, and I was thinking at the end of it, I was like, man, that, that was like one of the worst things that could have happened to him was his very first day. He just, you know, not only follows me into a trade, but he follows Four me into like an a, yeah, like an A plus trade and, and banks on it like that. That's going to raise his confidence way too high. You know, he's going to uh, think like trading's easy. And, yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, he's he's probably going to you know start making mistakes. And it was funny. Um, he, he, yeah, he made 17 grand that day, his very first day sitting next to me trading. And, and it was just because we had that play that day and, and him following me into the trade. Like it was just, um, yeah, that was probably the most memorable one that comes to mind. I mean, there's a lot, I could talk about a lot of tickers, Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but that, that one was just a funny situation. So, yeah. so little background so people can understand. All right. So this is like in the beginning or the middle of like the first year of COVID, like 2020, I think. And Donald yeah, Trump I is think, still president. And yeah. uh, Kodak, this is Kodak, the camera uh, company. They were into crypto like 2017 and their stock pumped like crazy. And then now like their Trump got them into pharmaceuticals or something. They got a, the government gave them a pharmaceutical <laughs> <Yeah>. contract. <laughs> this is a ridiculous. camera company. And uh, he's saying this is America's darling. Kodak's gonna save the. I don't know. This he's a pumper. At the time, it was it was a meme like pumper in chief. <laughs> and yeah, he, he did a. He said it on the news. He like did it on like live television too. Um, yeah, I remember watching it. Like, and like it went from like it, as he's talking, you see Kodak <laughs> start going crazy. Yeah, it was, it was hilarious. Yeah. <laughs> it's just funny, man. How it all happened, you know. It's just um, it was it was everything lined up you know and yeah but it was it was funny um i found out later there was some people that i know got squeezed pretty big you know they lost oh, yeah, uh, yeah. multiple seven figures on that and they couldn't get filled uh so they were they lost a lot of money that day and i yeah and i'm thinking man that sucks but um yeah i mean it was super liquid from like 30 dollars to 60 dollars, and i don't think anybody could get filled there um you know if they were trying to get out short so yeah that was insane. So that's just that guy's first trade. That's crazy. Where, uh, is he still trading? Is he actively? Yeah, he's still trading. Yeah, he's still trading. And he got humbled. You know, over the next like four months, he ended up basically losing all of that seventeen grand and back to break even. And and that's been a very kind of you know started ingraining in his head. Okay, like this isn't easy, and I need to like really study. And and we would sit down and we'd go over everything. I you know, showed him how to journal and go over trades, and I'd give him advice and and basically just. Um, I, I show these guys a lot, uh, or him and my brother, I show them, you know, uh, there's so many things you can't control in the market, just focus on what you can control. And, um, one thing you can control is working on your trading, you know? So yeah. that's, that's how you're going to get better. And, um, so yeah, absolutely. But he's doing man. good now, you know, both of them are doing well and we talk every day still, even though I moved to Florida, we get on, you know, the comms on the mic on discord and stuff and talk and. Go over, good. go over stuff and yeah they're both making money so they're, they're good listening stuff. they're learning they're getting better good stuff were they there for a dwac if you're there for kodak trump pump yeah you should, you're you should uh you'd be prepared for dwac right <laughs> they were there for dwac um they were a little bit more hesitant to trade that one because it wasn't so much of a straight up move right yeah was, yeah yeah the day that it ran it, it was kind of grindy it never really pulled back i ended up losing uh, money that day but um, I was very happy with that trade, uh, because that would have been a huge loss for me in the past. And so I handled it very well. And then I ended up making a lot more the following day, uh, whenever it topped out. So, and that's kind of what I was waiting for. So. Awesome. Um, and we're going to sort of wrap it up soon. So, but before that, so like, what, what's your biggest aha moment when trading, when, you know, you were, you were going sideways that one year that you gave yourself time to just do it full time. And then you went back to trading and like working in the car dealership part time. And then like, yeah. what, when did it be, be like, when did it click enough where you became profitable where you're like, okay, now I can go out on my own and, and uh, focus full time. I didn't, I didn't really have like an aha moment. Uh, I've been asked that before and I don't, there's nothing that really comes to mind where I'm like, um, you know, like this is it, you know, I found the Holy grail or something. I never really had that. Uh, the only aha moment I had was whenever I didn't realize how much money I was up. And then I looked at my, uh, you know, like what I was up on the year and I was, 
I was up a lot more than what I expected. And that's the only time I was like, holy shit. Um, but it, it was because I wasn't focusing on the money. You know, I just kept focusing on good trading, you know, like getting better, minimizing mistakes. You know, how can I improve here and uh, stop doing this? That's making me lose money. You know, I, I, the, the less you focus on the money, the better you're going to get. You know, um, people focus on too much of, you know, the, the micro and, and how much you're pulling in per day or per month or whatever. And it's really not about that. It's just focus on good trading. But um, to answer your question about, like, say, like a moment where I felt, um, you know, an aha, like I said, I don't really have one. But the, there was a moment like where things kind of became a little bit more clear um, of how to be patient, I, I would say was uh, whenever I started to really track enough data to where I saw, okay, I shouldn't even be trading these setups that I used to be trading because they really aren't high probability plays. Like this is just, uh, you know, like more of a 50-50 type of situation where, you know, maybe I'm shorting it and uh, yes, maybe it works and maybe it doesn't. Um, so it's, it's really not that high probability of a setup. You know, I should be focusing more on this where I have, you know, 75, 80% chance that the trade's going to work. And that's that's when I would say things became a little bit more clear and, and it made me be more patient for, you know, uh, certain plays, certain setups, certain entries, uh, just things that I could uh, give myself an opportunity to even, you know, win in a trade. You know, it's okay to, uh, you know, lose on 10 of them um, if you're going to win on, you know, the other 70. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. um, I guess what I'm saying is whenever I started really breaking down the data and seeing the odds of how things work uh, for certain setups, uh, then it became more clear, okay, cut these out, cut these out. You know, I'm not even making money here, even though they, I think I am when I really look at the everything, it's, it's really just not that great. It's not a great play. I should just be waiting for this. And uh, cause that's where I'm really making the money and that's what has, gives me the highest odds. So that, that's what I would say is that's whenever I really started breaking down data. Awesome. And uh, where do you see yourself in the future with trading? Um, well, I don't know, man. Um, I've thought about that a lot and um, I'm, I, I'm just going to trade for the rest of my life. That's how I feel. I mean, I love it. I'm not going yeah. anywhere. Um, I like mentoring my brother and my buddy, you know, and I've seen a lot of progress out of them. I've, I've even mentioned that on Twitter. You know, I've, I've, I've been thinking a lot about uh, maybe mentoring some guys, uh, not necessarily newbies, just people that have experience and, um, you know, maybe just want that extra little, you know, push to get to the, the level that they want. They just maybe need some advice on how to do it. Um, so I've, I've thought about doing that and I answer a lot of questions on, on DMs through Twitter and stuff like that. So I, I, I see myself um, uh, just doing what I'm doing now, um, but just kind of on a bigger scale, you know, and then helping people in return, you know. So I don't really have a vision of where I would be in the future for, for trading um, other than just having a bigger account, and trading bigger size and stuff like that. Um, yeah. For sure. For sure. Awesome. And uh, lastly, any book recommendations? books oh man okay so i'll give you a trading book um I, i'm sure everybody's heard of it reminiscence of a stock operator that's a great book uh there's tons of little tips and tricks and stuff in there that yeah. are about trading it's and it's a great story and it's um it's a true story um but there's things there's key things that are said in that book that i still use in my trading today like one of the best quotes in that book is um uh he, the guy says um i never buy the bottom and i always sell too early and all he's really saying is he's taking his piece. You know, he's not trying to, um, you know, yeah. guess. He's waiting for confirmation, and then he's never getting greedy either. So all he's saying is basically he's taking his piece. You know, and that's all you really need to do in the market is just take your piece. You know, take your piece every day, stay consistent, and uh, you know, build off of that. And then I'll, I'll give another book, and it has nothing to do with trading, but it's probably one of my favorite books of all time, and it's called um, uh, "As a Man Thinketh." And it's, it's about uh, basically mindset, you know, and how uh, like the brain works. And it's, it's so, it's so powerful and it's such a, a short read. It's only like 70 pages and it's just this itty bitty book, you know, is written over a hundred years ago. And um, yeah, there's just so many lessons in that. I like to read it just once a year 
you know, just remind myself and you can always pick something out of it. You know, like it's just, uh, and think about it and it's just mind blowing and it, and it really keeps you on track too. And it's just uh, a great book for keeping a good mindset and keeping good perspective and attitude and staying humble. Yeah. Absolutely, man. Um, well, Maya, man, it's been great t- talking with you over the podcast and I'm sure a lot of people are going to get a lot of value from this, a lot of insight there from beginning to end man. so thanks so much once again and yeah we'll keep in contact and and uh yeah i'll talk to you later sounds good man i appreciate the time i'll see you man have a good good uh, rest of your day